Title 17 U.S. Code, Sections 107 to 108 of the Copyright Law. All media in this video is used for the purpose of review and commentary under terms of fair use. All footage, music, and images used belong to their respective companies. Also, YouTube, please, for the love of Gun X Sword, the perfect anime, fix your broken system when you are able because Quint will blame me. Oh my goodness, my hair is terrible. friends, Toji, Kinsuke, all of their homes have been destroyed and now they've left. Friends, I don't have anybody left I could call my friend. Greetings comrades and hello everyone, I'm Kun866. And welcome back to the End of Memories Retrospective. Since this is a retrospective, it comes highly recommended that you watch the other videos for convenience and or context. While not required, it might show you the origin of some of the recurring jokes and gags on my channel. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and on the topic of this being a retrospective, for those who do know, I have made several offhanded remarks, directly or indirectly, that my favorite anime of all time, I've even declared it the perfect anime, Gun X Sword is my favorite anime of all time. And with Gun X Sword being a mecha series, I was thoroughly impressed by it. But you want to know the irony is? I haven't actually seen that many mecha series. Like, the few I've seen are the Full Metal Panic line of uh, mega series. I have all of them, including from Mofu, The Second Raid, the original Invisible Victory, and that's all fine and dandy. I've also seen uh, Code Geass, you know, that's another mega series. I still prefer Gun X by a long shot, though. But, um, it's kind of funny because another reason why I did this retrospective was because I was kind of trying to find myself an anime that I enjoyed more than Gun X Sword or just as much. And while I haven't found anything conclusive yet. The closest I've come is Chrono Crusade and maybe Demon Slayer. I haven't reviewed Demon Slayer yet, but in due time. Though, because my favorite anime of all time is a mecha series, and for those who don't know, mecha series have giant robots. A uh, few examples might be, like, Transformers. Not technically an anime, but it's still a mecha genre series. Uh, the Gundam series is a great example. The Big O, etc. It's like... I have a very, very few, uh, 
viewing history of mech issues. Now, I have a few I haven't, uh, have physical copies of, like Gurren Lagann. Seriously, Aniplex, why no Blu-rays? But, the bottom line is, despite my favorite anime series being a mecha, I haven't seen that many mecha series. Which is the topic of today's video, because I was using Neon Genesis Evangelion as a way to, one, expand my collection, and two, see what all the hype is about. Because a lot of people have hyped up Evangelion, even calling it an innovative deconstruction of the mecha series. And this came out in 1994 first, so I'm actually interested to see what the mecha was like way back then. I had heard a lot about Evangelion before even starting the series. There were critiques, there were reviews, two movies, a video game, the rebuilds, and so much more. I had heard a lot about Evangelion, and honestly, I didn't really consider trying it because it didn't seem like something I'd be into. I like mecha series, but psychological ones are a bit of a hard pill to swallow. But there were so many cosplayers and praising, and there was critiques too. But after a while, I decided to give it a shot. I mean, seriously guys, look at this Wikipedia page. This extensive amount of data proves that this series has an audience. So I went on to Amazon, got myself the box that had both the original 26 episodes of the anime, the Death Plus Rebirth movie, and End of Evangelion for a pretty fair price. I think I only got it for like 25 or 30 bucks. So I'm like, yeah, I could give it a shot. So I took this thing out of the sleeve, pulled out the disc, slapped it into my Blu-ray and- This is, this is, and this is as well. Representations, everything is merely a description, not the real myself. We're gonna be here a while. <sighs> Jeez. This is gonna be one of those kind of animes, isn't it? Oh jeez. What have I gotten myself into? I want you to take a wild guess as to what kind of world Neon Genesis Evangelion has. Go on, guess. Did you say Japanese town? Bingo! You are totally right! Bingo! 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 It's bingo! <sighs> Look, I have nothing against Japanese towns and series, guys, but come on, can they do remotely anything unique? ANYTHING? Well, yes, they can, actually. <laughs> I fooled you there for a second, didn't I? Believe me, I'm trying to, because I had to do multiple takes of this line. Tokyo 3, yes, that's what it's called, don't ask, is actually a pretty unique spin on the overused generic town-like location. With this taking place in the apocalypse, it makes it a little bit more unique and have an identity of its own. The lighting in areas feel really unique and solid. It also makes it, well, because of the apocalypse, feel like a desperate setting. The cramped interiors with the shroud of darkness, people being overly worried, the silence in the hallways, it does well in delivering a foreboding atmosphere. With the dark and isolated tone of Evangelion, it excellently encapsulates the feeling of what it's going for. When the main threats, the angels, attack, things get weird and supernatural, like taking a descent down the elevator during the last angel encounter, and they end up in some white space-like backdrop that looks like the moon of all places. It grabs my eyes, which is good. The best aspect of the world by far is the technology, and I'm glad people seem to agree with me on this one. The mechas themselves, called the Ava units, have topped people's list for interesting mechas, and I can see why. They aren't number one spot material for me, personally, although they are unlike any other mechas I've ever seen, downright to the way they operate. Lore-wise, the series is pretty complex. The big ruinous event, the second impact, Lily destroyed an entire continent, and a foreshadowed third impact surely will destroy more. Characters' motivations can be centered around the impact and the cause and destruction it might, well, impact. <laughs> the main antagonists, of course, the angels, are pretty in the dark. Like, you don't really know what's going on with them. At least, I didn't. So motive-wise, the angels as antagonists are pretty ambiguous. 
Ambiguity can work well, but it kind of wavers here and there. Yeah, this is a bit of a misstep in terms of the world of Evangelion. Is that lore-wise, it's very deep. Too deep. It's like, we get a decent degree of psychological dive into the characters, though the angels... Apart from the last one, there's not really much to them. Yeah, they have interesting powers and, you know, it makes them, you know, they feel like a proper threat for sure. But like, we don't really know much about them. Like, what's their goal? Are they even evil? Like, why do they attack Tokyo 3 in particular? These are all things the series doesn't describe very well, and it's incredibly confusing. Like, I know there's a bunch of religious symbolism and references, and if you have a Bible on hand, you could probably go like, yeah, this symbolizes this and this, but I shouldn't have to do that, guys. The casuals aren't gonna know that. Assuming they don't, you know, read the Bible religiously. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm not gonna lie, the lore is a bit of a misstep, though, Otherwise, the world presentation-wise has, you know, good visuals, the animation's a bit stiff, but this is 1994, so I kinda gotta be lenient there. Uh, the audio is alright, nothing mind-blowing. In fact, this is actually the series I've said, because remember in audio sections, I've always said I haven't seen an anime with a quote-unquote bad soundtrack, and I've seen even less anime with a mid-soundtrack. Even Galley is a rare case of a mid-soundtrack. It's not good or bad. It's just there, and honestly, I'm fine with that, because even Galing isn't naturally supposed to be a very audible. it's not supposed to be a very audible world, you know, the music is more meant to increase the atmosphere, and the anime uses silence a lot of time to kind of increase, you know, that kind of general uncertainty, something that Elf and Lee did to a bad extent. Here, they use silence to a somewhat better degree, but there's also times where silence just creates awkward moments, as evidenced by episode 4, the worst episode in Evangelion, just gonna say. That being said though, I do think the world we got ourselves here is solid. Tokyo 3 is not overly generic, it has its own pull and charm, and the lore is a little too ambitious for what it's trying to do, but it doesn't take away from the world being admittedly pretty intriguing, and I'm actually glad. I was honestly worried considering Japanese towns are overused in anime, much like forests are overused. But, uh, like, here's the thing about Tokyo 3. I think other worlds we've covered thus far are much better, but Tokyo 3 is a much more interesting Japanese town than Tomoeda, Juban, other Japanese towns we've covered. Especially Elven Leeds. God, don't even get me started in Elven Leeds. That anime sucked so bad. Although, guys, this is just world we're talking about here. A series can have a good world. I'm sorry to reference this again. WATV had a really good world. Fall Gaia was incredibly interesting. And the characters were certainly unique. They weren't necessarily a traditional cast. Far from it. But what made WATV fall flat was the story and the writing, which also did kind of bleed over into the character zone quality. Still though, seeing the adventure dudes and treasure girls in WATV despite that was endearing, because as characters, they weren't traditional. And I think this is a good segue into the characters of Evangelion, because boy, there's a lot to say about them. Don't ever say that. Just don't say that you have nothing else. Just don't say that. And don't say goodbye when you leave on a mission. It's just too sad. <laughs> From what I hear, even Galleon's characters are the selling point in the series. Characters like Rei Ayanami have made list of best waifus, best girls of all time. Same thing with Asuka Langley Soryu. So, it goes without saying that Evangelion's characters are primarily the focus. I mean, it's a psychological series, and the most psychological thing you can be about is the characters. And a desperate location like Tokyo 3 is a good way to explore that. They're desperate. It would allow for very psychological approaches and story-type trends. So, Neon Genesis Evangelion does a good job at setting up that point. I mean, many... I mean, many characters, like 90% of the cast, are 
incredibly conflicted or traumatized due to the apocalyptic setting, and understandably so. That does kind of concern me if you lore, so it kind of, a bit. But that's not something I should be too critical of. I'm actually going to save my talk about the primary protagonist of character Shinji Ikari for a bit later, since I have an entire segment dedicated just to him. So for now, I'll talk about the other mains, or plot crucial characters. Starting with who is widely considered the most hated character, Gendo Ikari. People say he's a deadbeat father Shinji, a manipulative figure in the Ava projects, and obsessed to his life to the point of world chaos. Now, I am in no way defending this guy since he is no righteous man, not in the slightest. In fact, I've even seen Gendo get compared to the likes of Shao Tucker from Fullmetal Alchemist. However, neither of these guys make my list of top 10 most hated characters. Why? Shao Tucker's screen time in Brotherhood especially was short. Yeah, the impact was dreadful, but it only lasted a single episode, guys. While I did have more screen time in 03, and was more hateable there, I feel like that worked better for him and made his purpose more meaningful. Gendo might be a horrible person, but is he a badly written character? I wouldn't say so. That's not to say he's a great character, he's just sort of there, I guess? Like, he does shady stuff, has an intimidating appearance all around him, and you just get this sense of uncertainty with him hiding his secrets, both from his associates and the viewers. They're okay ideas, but they're just not implemented that well. Obviously, Gendo is supposed to be an antagonist of sorts, but I don't know, I just don't really know what it is they're trying to go for with him. Like, I see he's not in any way attached to Shinji, but like, as an antagonist, you're not really supposed to be attached to the protagonist. And hey, Gendo did popularize the famous finger tenting pose, which not only Neon Genesis Evangelion itself used, but many other series as well. I think the finger tenting pose Gendo made is iconic for the right reason, so I like it. I'm not saying Gendo was the first character who did this, but he definitely popularized the trend, so I'm not necessarily disturbed by his screen time anyways. Up next of our mains is Misato Katsurugi. She's okay, I think she works as a villain guardian or caretaker for Shinji. Personality-wise, she's the most sane of the bunch. Yeah, she has some personal problems. Though, in comparison to everyone else, hers are less impactful, or at the very least, she handles them better. She does give everything and her all, and she has a high level of energy and extroverted nature to mask her past. That's nice, but I want to say more, but I just don't really have much else to add. Apart from her relationship with Ryoji Kaji, who I guess I might as well talk about him now, um, <laughs> it tries to feel deep, but it's not. But Ryoji Kaji, I'd even say, is even more simple. He's really just a flamboyant intel gatherer who has feelings for Mizato, though trouble past prevents them from, like, going anywhere with it. It's... <sighs> It's super convoluted, the series doesn't do a very good job at explaining it, it's super... Like, it tries to be subtle, but to a point that it's confusing. Like, good jeez. I, I don't even know what to make of it. Well, I guess I can't beat around the bush any longer. Now we can cover the five Ava pilots, who are, effectively, our primary protagonists, give or take. The first of the bunch, which, oh, by the way, I'm not covering Shinji first. I'm covering the easiest one to cover first. I'm going to cover Toji Suzuharu. He's the most simple of the bunch. He was a student before getting called into the project where he piloted an Ava and got wrecked in battle. Prior to that, he kind of butted heads with Shinji at the school. Uh, again, you know, apocalyptic nature. People are dying. The angels, second impact, everyone's all tense. But he does gradually come to terms with it, and eventually when he does enter the battle, well, he gets wrecked. And honestly guys, Toji just isn't very likable. He's really bare bones, just not that interesting. I'm not a fan of how when he got trashed, Shinji just feels like, OH IT'S MY FAULT! Which, okay, yeah, Shinji did fight him in the Ava, but like, 
Come on, Shinji. You're in the middle of what is effectively a war zone. Why are you beating yourself up over this? Toji knew what he was getting himself into as well, but... <sighs> yeah, not a very good first impression. But oh boy, next up is Asuka Langley Soryu. Good jeez. <laughs> oh, God, man. Here's where my true thoughts start unfolding. Guys, I like a strong female character. But this is not it. Asuka is a huge brat, totally arrogant, and super bossy to boot. It's not even one of those cases of, like, a jerk character becomes more honorable, like a Sunu or something. Oh, no, no, no. Asuka stays just as bitchy from the start of the series until the end of the series. Like, the only noteworthy change is her piloting skills as it goes on and revealing her past and trauma and all that jazz. AKA, not much. By no means is Asuka a team player. She's mocking Shinji and getting mad at Rei for small things. The weight of the world is hinging on the Ava pilots cooperating, and Asuka all you're doing is effectively tearing up the team to save humanity, creating stress and tension, which does not work well in a danger scenario. God, I hate Asuka Langley Soryu so much. I feel like there's a common misconception about strong female characters. Strong female is not the same as bitchy. Like Airs of Scarlet from Fairy Tale. Strong female. Faye Valentine from Cowboy Viva. Bitchy. Integra from Helsing. Strong female. Sango from Inuasha. Also a strong female. Sailor Neptune. Bitchy. Sailor Uranus. Also bitchy. Asuka Langley. Freaking Soryu. Bitchy with a capital B. I'm even more shocked that people actually think Asuka is, like, best anime waifu of all time. What is there to like about her? Look, if you're attracted to Asuka, that's none of my business. But here's the thing, guys. Yeah, she looks hot. But does she act hot? No! If Asuka can't even get along with Rei, a mostly silent girl, you know, someone who you really don't have a reason or excuse to get angry over, then how on earth do you expect to get along with Asuka? Yeah, she has a traumatic backstory. I understand you feeling sorry for that, but the way it's written is so, so overcooked, and I just can't give a damn. Like, <laughs> God, I need to clear my head from this awful, horrible character. Then I could undo this awful, horrible nightmare. How about Rei Ayanami, now that I mention her, because, as I said before, Asuka gets mad at Rei for small things. Another waifu. How does Rei Ayanami hold up? Not much better. Yeah, yeah, she's not annoying like Asuka, so that's fine and dandy. Yes, she looks attractive. Fine. What's the problem? There's basically nothing here. Apart from her just being an enigmatic and mostly quiet character, I find little appealing to her aside from appearances. Though that might be due to the artist's choice of having all the mecha pilots wear tight revealing suits. Yeah, you could probably make anyone look attractive in those costumes. Just saying. I get why Rey was written this way for the twist at the end, which admittedly was solid, but again, similar to Asuka, I don't see why she's making best list of anime waifus of all time. As a character, she's honestly not even that deep. You can't interpret silence, guys. I mean, yes, there are multiple ways to do so, but who's to say one way is what? I can't even English correctly. Like. Why are these two females, like, so beloved by anime fans when I don't see a lot to like? 
Asuka gives me reasons to not like her at all because of her bitchiness. Meanwhile, Rey, there's not enough content to even observe or even like. Like, okay, I'll give Rey a pass since, you know, I understand why. Because, you know, the twist and all, you know, big dramatic twist, you know, can add things to a character. That's fine, I'll give her a pass. But God, do people overhype her. And I'm just, I'm just let down. I'm incredibly let down. Kavu Nagisa is my personal favorite character. He's got that sort of mysterious vibe Rei had, but it's used to a better extent and he's more talking. I know there is the whole debate whether or not Kavu is into Shinji or not. Yes, people are overanalyzing if he's gay. However, I try not to focus on that since Evangelion isn't even a romance-centered anime anyways. Another reason why I'm not necessarily attracted to either Rei or Asuka because romance is not a heavy theme here. He's got good wit, shows a sharp degree of cunning in his methods, and you might think, yeah, I'm totally down with this guy, right? Well, nope, even he has problems surviving my favorite character. His screen time is pitiful in the original anime, and while yes, his story is better, it has his own problems, but that's a topic for the story segment. I honestly think Kavu is more average, which is not a good sign. And now... <sighs> Oh my mama, we have got to talk about Shinji Ikari. Let me ask all of you, are there those times where you invest yourself in a story and there's just a single character who feels like he holds down the rest of the cast from both a character and writing standpoint? For me, that is exactly how I feel about Shinji. To be fair to Shinji, he does have justifiable reasons for being depressed. That's totally fine. I mean, his father's a deadbeat, his mother is gone, he is separated from any attachments he had, he's antisocial, has no friends, and when he does get called back to see his father, it's basically to put him in the line of battle. See, he has a good reason to be depressed and incredibly, well, conflicted. These are good. It's a good foundation. What's the problem? That is literally it. All of Shinji. No, no, no. Please, please do not tell me, oh, you're not reading it right. There's your psychological thing. Blah, blah. No, no. I don't care if this is a psychological anime with tons of religious symbolism. If I don't get it and if it's confusing, it's basically falling on deaf ears. It's so complicated, and for a character type that is pretty simple, the zero to hero. However, I don't even think Shinji is that. Like, Simon from Gurren Lagann, he's a zero to hero. Yeah, he was shrimpy, he was wimpy, Simon White, but he grew out of it and he saw the bigger picture, making Simon everything Shinji should have been, because good lord! Shinji doesn't grow, he doesn't learn, and refuses to even try. This makes rooting for Shinji impossible. Like, remember how I said Elf and Lee, the whole thing is about, you know, characters introduced, they're sad, they're trying to force sympathy. Here, they did it again. I'd even say worse. Like, it's not even just Shinji. They're trying to make me feel sorry for these characters, and I don't. Like, are the reasons for them being sorry understandable? Yes. But does the writing complement it? No. Like, not only is it forced as hell, but it's brought in so early. Like, I'm literally 10 minutes into the first episode when Shinji's all like, I don't want to get in the Ava. And I'm all like, guys, I'm 10 minutes into the first episode and you're already treating me like I'm supposed to be like, no, Shinji, no. It's like, you can't expect me to automatically fall in love with a sad character when I'm not even halfway through the first bloody episode. And it goes beyond that. Like, if the depression theme was put in the middle or at the end of the series, it might have been, you know, more understandable. We could have seen a more reserved, level-headed Shinji at the start of the series. Some big event happens that makes him more depressed for the latter half. See, that'd be fine. I mean, look at Trigun. Trigun did that with Vash being, you know, more eccentric, more level-headed and goofy in the first half. But when Legato appears and knives all the gung guns, Vash becomes... 
a lot more complex and deep of a character. But because Shinji starts out sad and pessimistic, it only gets worse. And after the fifth episode, I just wanted them to go somewhere with this character, and they don't. Like, do I hate the idea of a depressed character? No! There are series that do depressed characters wonderfully. There are even times where having a character who never progressed can work well for the story. The issue is, having this kind of character as the protagonist is so difficult. Gunnick Sword did it, and they did it really well, but I can see why people might be skeptical of Vaughn in the first few episodes. That's why I feel like the depressed character works better as a side character, or maybe even a secondary main. But with Shinji being the primary main protagonist, who you're going to be spending all 26 episodes, the two movies, the games, blah 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 with, it makes spending all the screen time with him unbearable, and it just keeps going! Evangelion tries so hard to pump tears from me out of the series, and I can't. I don't. I won't, and I refuse to. You can't just throw me into the first episode, not even halfway through, and expect me to instantly love this character because he has some tragic, sad backstory when I barely have time to analyze. Just get out of here, even Gelly. I'm not even gonna wear the cat ears because I don't even feel happy anymore. Like, you did not earn my emotional attachment. And the fact that this is one of my biggest complaints about Evangelion, not only in the characters, but it bleeds over into the story as well. The sympathy, the sad emotion, it doesn't feel earned. It's not even just Shinji either, guys. They try and do it for Asuka, make her bitchy, but then reveal in episode 21, oh, it's the sad backstory, Ray, character is silent, always. It's like, you want me to cling on, but you're not giving me good reasons to do so. Furthermore, with all the waifus in Evangelion, the romance is non-existent. Yeah, that's another reason I don't stand either Rei or Asuka, because affectionate relationships are not a focus of Evangelion. Yes, there are implications, yes, there are themes, yes, there are times where romance is a part of the story, but it's never the primary focus. Sure, Shinji might have hidden feelings for Asuka, or even Kaoru. He doesn't know how to let out, fine. But Kao only has one episode, and for Asuka, I feel like Shinji would just not get along well with her because of the way she treats him. But it's like... And for Kaoru, a character I really like, the romance implications there are rushed. Like, the way I see it when Kaoru does the confessional I love you line, which got mistranslated in the Netflix adaptation and everyone flailed over it. I always viewed that as a means to an end. That was Kaoru's kind of way of deceiving Shinji. I mean, Kaoru's uh, angel name, like G Ganfrio, like there's like angel names that tie into the religious stuff and he's the angel of deceit. I thought it was a means to an end, but people say that he did genuinely care for Shinji despite his purpose. Now, could there be truth to that? Yeah, Kaoru might have actually cared about Shinji, but like, we won't know, because he's there for one episode. So, like, people misinterpret this, and it, it gets to all the fan service and fan art and all this stuff that just, just doesn't sit right with me. And again, it all centers back to Shinji. He's such a difficult character for me to support. I do understand why he's the way he is. That's fine. But the writing is flat out bad. It wasn't earned. The poor writing and blatant ploy of hinging on audience sympathy can only win me over so much. God, what a weak protagonist you are, Shinji. You know what? Scratch that. Talk about a weak cast. Literally, everyone has some sort of mental problem or emotional biz that makes them blend in way too much. No matter how different their personalities are or if it makes sense given the world, I just like the characters all the same. They start out sad, they stay sad, they keep getting more sad. I said the same thing about Elfin Lee and Eden Galleon. Like, is it realistic? Sure, but to hell with realism! This is anime! Like, 
what are they trying to achieve here? Like, yeah, people say this is an innovative deconstruction of the mecha genre. Oh, sure, it's a deconstruction, all right, of my brain cells. Holy jumping jelly donuts. You thought my praise about the world may lead into a decent or even passable character section. No, not this time. We've gone into a steep decline in what is unquestionably the least compelling cast I've seen in the retrospective yet. Nah, scratch that. High Guarding Spices cast is worse. But it's still fucking close, guys. I mean, at least Elfin Leeds villains had, you know, depth or context. The angels here are really a simple threat to their core, or too cryptic for those wanting to do a bunch of translating to find out what it all means. Like, it's nice to not have a series force lore down my throat like Jerusha did in Fall Gaia, or WTV for that. But like, especially when this story is kind of hinging on the lore, it makes me not getting it or being confusing and then not explaining it, it makes it fall on deaf ears. It's like, guys, why should I have to pull out a Bible to find out this represents this, this represents this, this represents this? Like, th this is anime. I should be able to watch it and get it with a general grasp. I should even get a vague idea, and I don't. Like, I can't believe I'm saying this. I thought Elfin Lead and High Guardian Spice were as low as it could get. But NGE, despite not being as bad as High Guardian Spice, still amazed me with how bad it is. Like, this series has gotten so much praise for its deep and complex characters. And you know, to be fair, at the time when this came out in 1994, depressing dark stories like this hadn't normally been tackled in anime. I get that, you know. At the time this came out, if people were attached to these characters because it was unlike anything they'd ever seen, that's fine. If it's nostalgia, more power to you. But at this day and age, there's just better alternatives to watch. Series that do depressed characters better, that don't cram stuff down my throats, that have lore that is not confusing and not forcibly explained or not explained at all, and even Galleon has just aged. That's the best way I can describe it. Unless you grew up with it or you can turn the hands of time back in your mind, even Galleon is going to be a hard watch. Wow. Like, I'm sure I have angered a ton of fan base. I I'm sure when people view this video, they're gonna say, you're not reading this character as right. Oh, you hate this character. Guys, because I'm not nostalgic of this just I didn't grow up with it, and while yes, I can turn the hands of time in my mind back, I did so with Sailor Moon and whatnot, I can only go so far with the it's old be lenient argument. Because I don't find it fun to watch these characters. They just, they're in a constant stalemate. They don't grow, they don't evolve. It's like, you can say it's intentional, but Intentional or not, if it's not enjoyable to watch, then what's the point? And how about that story? What is the story gonna do with these characters? Well, let's see. You know, pain is something that man must endure in his heart. And since the heart feels pain so easily, some believe life is pain. You are delicate like glass, especially your heart. I am? Yes. And worth earning my empathy. Empathy? I'm saying I love you. Well, I have already firmly established that Shinji starts out depressed and just stays that way. If I were to do an episode by episode description, I'd just rant about Shinji for every single one, so let's not do that. I'll just have to generally surmise things while pointing out any noteworthy events and or instances. Well, okay, for starters, despite the incredibly samey, traumatized, depressed characters, there is, at the very least, solid chemistry. Shinji's more introverted nature, clashing with Asuka's bitchiness and Mizado, does well making the interactions between cast members unique. You would think Rei would get along with Shinji with them both being quiet, but she remains oddly distant for most of the series. 
As for the mechas, I've established that they are interesting tech-wise, and lore-wise, they're okay, though half of it I don't even get. What I do know is that the Avas themselves are alive. They're living beings, which is actually pretty different compared to a mass of metal and wires that most mechas go for. Sadly, the Ava units themselves aren't really used that much outside of action scenes, with the series mostly focusing on the pilots, which is okay, and I imagine that's intentional since, again, this is meant to be a deconstruction of the mecha genre. And it's not like other mechas before and after have focused on the pilots of the mechas, and that's fine. I mean, look at Gurren Lagann. The series does nearly the same thing it does with Shinji. Zero to hero. That's fine. And with this coming out in 1995, I will say this is innovative for understandable reasons. But keep in mind, I firmly believe that innovation and quality are separate. You don't have to break any new grounds to be good. On the other side of that equation, just because you do break grounds doesn't mean it's gonna be good. And I believe Neon Genesis Evangelion is a case of the latter. Sure, I'm absolutely positive this grabbed people's attention back in 1995. Darker series weren't nearly as common in anime, but trying themes like this would certainly open a ton of eyes. Anime was kind of still in its infancy around that time. However, watching it today when I've seen other series makes it literally impossible to watch this, and it makes the package really weak. Yes, I am fully aware and I understand that if I had watched this back in 1994 and 1995, I'd probably be praising the crap out of it. And I am taking into account, because I do keep in mind this sort of thing, but it only goes so far. Again, I can't justify everything behind the it's old be lenient argument. Back on the mechas though, I mentioned action scenes are mainly what they're used for. Aside from the pilot's personal issues, lore dumping, moments of downtime which take up to about 15 minutes of every episode. That means action scenes last for the last 5 or so minutes. Actually, no, make that the last like 3-ish minutes, since usually the last 2 are used for the credits in the preview. Short action scenes for the most part. Some can go on a bit longer or even a bit shorter, but I just wanted to paint a general picture for y'all. And on the topic of it, how about those action scenes? You know me, I'm a huge sucker for action. I mean, literally, some series that don't necessarily have action as a big forefront focus, when they do decide to have an action scene, I know a good action scene when I see one. And with Evangelion's really unique tech, you'd think they'd be really interestingly used with these super, super deep and lore expansive angels. How about it? Nope! I am holding nothing back here, guys. The action scenes in Neon Genesis Evangelion are a total show. I do have a few positives, like the angel abilities being more unique than the typical fire element, water element, thunder element, wind element, rock element, etc, etc, etc. There are actually unique abilities and strangely threatening physical designs. So, it makes it hard to tell what the angels are trying to do. Mix that with their lack of personality or words, bearing the exception of the very last angel, and it can deliver good in the unsure apocalyptic atmosphere. However, the Ava units are... <sighs> Alright, I've already by this point probably riled up the hornet's nest, and people are probably going to dislike this video for all my hot takes, but I'm going all out. I've come this far, there's no reason for me to hesitate now. Guys, I like action series. Not just action series, but action scenes that are good, I know when I see them. I mean, hell, even a series that doesn't necessarily focus on action, like take Death Note for example, episode 23, Frenzy with a huge car chase, was absolutely amazing. And most of the time, I can get down with action and set aside gripes as I enjoy them easily. Nope, not here. The action scenes are short, anticlimactic, and don't feel good to pull through. For the fights where massive damage is dealt or losses occur, this makes sense. You're not supposed to feel good, even when surviving. 
But even the fights they do better in still don't feel good, making any sense of victory pride pointless. That's not even touching on the times where they don't seem to be armed right for the fight, and in a few minutes of preparation, they get a weapon or strategy that helps them ultimately defeat the angel, and it comes out of nowhere half the time. More importantly than any of that, though, is the stakes. Clearly, Evangelion wants me to think the stakes are high, because I can't tell what the Evangelions and angels are trying to do. Like, apparently the angels are trying to cause the third impact, but why? Is that what they're trying to do? I don't even know. Why can Tokyo's third impact only be done from the terminal at the bottom of the city? The anime doesn't explain it, so it makes no sense. And when the pilots are using, you know, their abilities and they start, you know, not winning, they're losing on the lower end of the fight, they go ancient berserk. I cringe because I think I'm supposed to be like, oh, awesome, power! Or, oh my gosh, they're going crazy. But I can't tell what's going on, and I just don't care. I didn't come for action scenes to give me religious symbolism with giant robots blanking around like freaking monkeys. I came here to see a spectacle in a fight where they get to use the interesting Ava tech in a cool and flashy way. Because they force in these out of place shenanigans, I can't get invested in the action scenes because it doesn't feel earned. For fuck's sake, Evangelion, your action scenes are lame. You couldn't even give me that. I look forward to action, but you don't even give me half of the fights that should be using the lore, abilities, and all this stuff, and you just don't. Maybe it's because they're shorter, maybe it's because they're meant to be darker, but why are these fights so lame? And this goes for most of the fights. The only action scenes I remotely remember are the first one, because of course I remember the first one, the angel with Asuka out in the boats. This one only is memorable because freaking Asuka, and it was a water fight. The twins that forced Shinji and Asuka to attack in perfect sync. The angel that tried to take over Toji's Ava unit and got him out of commission. And the very last one, which I will dedicate an episode description to because at the very least, this one feels like a proper fight with stakes and impact, and it also goes on a bit longer, which helps. Before we get to that, though, I do have a bit of a uh, story I gotta tell about my personal experience before getting here. So, during my first watch through of Neon Genesis Evangelion, it was actually with a friend, a co-worker of mine. We got to episode 5 or 4, I believe, and I was like, Man, it's just not doing it for me. And he didn't seem like he was really doing it for him either. It just kind of seemed really, uh, just like really convoluted. And it doesn't help that when I watched even Galleon afterwards, I started the series fresh. You know, maybe thought, okay, maybe you no, know, because it was over, we just ate or whatever. I watched it over again. When I got to episode four, the worst episode in the series, no question. Episode four is a lazy mess of boredom the biggest sin you can commit in any form of entertainment. I wondered to myself, will the series get any better? Are the action scenes going to pick up? Are they going to do something with Shinji? What's going on with Rei? All of these questions echoed in my mind, and I presumed watching, curious enough, until Toji got messed up, and I felt incredibly empty. Toji was a character I never really cared for anyways, and since this big climactic fight comes in the middle of this series, they're trying to treat it like, oh no, big death, oh, transition, uh, and I'm just all like, like, guys, I haven't got enough time with Toji, you haven't given me a reason to like him, and this is around episode 15, roughly halfway through the series, and usually midpoint is supposed to be a transitioning point. And Toji dying and Shinji being like, it's my fault, oh gosh! And I just like, as that episode ended, I think it was episode 15 or so, correct me if I'm wrong, I just remember getting to the credits and I was mad. That's it? Are you kidding me? I waited half of the series for that to happen? Those sort of thoughts rung in my mind like a church bell. However, I kept at it since I made it this far, this thing didn't cost me a lot of money, might as well keep going. So after painstakingly convincing myself to 
put this Blu-ray in when I really just wanted to watch something else. I got to episode 21 and I finally caved in and admitted this series was beyond saving. Yeah, there were five episodes left, but I knew no matter what sort of things they could pull, even if they made a brilliant ending, that made the rest of the series totally bad. It doesn't, like, it, hypothetically, if even Gelling's ending was some sort of masterpiece, I still wouldn't give it a fair score or a high score because 20 episodes of bad design can't, like, the ending can't save that. And I was expecting the worst, and you know what? I expected mostly accurate. But hey, five episodes are left. I'm at the home stretch, right? So, I finally made it to episode 24 where. Call me, call me. Uh, oh! Oh, Shinji actually going somewhere different with his character. Oh, oh, foreshadowing to the uh, seal villains. Oh, bathhouse scene. Oh, an actual fight scene! The series is actually doing something different with its episode structure. Okay. Honestly, this episode, in my opinion, is the high point of the series. And I'm glad to say that the fan base also seems to agree with me on this one, as episode 24 has been given a lot of attention and praise. And I'm glad it has the best fight in the series. It's the episode that if I was forced to watch any episode of Evangelion again, this would be it. And like I said, the fight scene actually has urgency to it. It's not even close to the Cheyenne versus Keanu fight, which was just okay. And this fight is just average. But, again, it's not necessarily a compliment. Being average is better than not being good. But boy, even though this is the most acceptable episode for me, I still have issues with it. On the topic of Kaoru, my favorite character, this is the episode he was introduced. It's clear something was up with him. I mean, every character has something up with them, like Rei's silence, Asuka's trauma, Misato's past, Gendo's ambition, and of course Shinji's emotions. I mean, this boy literally peers out of nowhere and is humming to himself, turning to Shinji and seemingly getting along with him right off the bat. This was a surprise since Shinji was distant from literally everyone, so seeing a level of fondness and friendship between Kaoru was a nice little change. We do even get some story stuff with Misato spying on Kaoru since she finds him suspicious. On the other hand, Kaoru is actually talking with members of Sile, who have been in contact with Gendu Ikari and his operations with the Ava pilots and their units. It seems like Kaoru isn't just another pilot like Shinji, Rei, Asuka, and Toji. I mean, this is evidenced by during his training, his sync levels were perfect despite having little time to learn the mechanics of Asuka's Eva unit. A few more scenes pass, one of them being the bath scene, with yes, fan service, because of course, Shinji and Kaoru have a bit of heart to heart, and yes, the I love you confession that fans and shippers overanalyze. Going back with the people alongside Gendo, they aren't firing Kaoru, just came to them as a pilot. Here is where... It is time. Let us go, Adam's Dark Shadow, Servant of the Lilo. Ava Unit 2 just activated! That's impossible! Where's Asuka? She's in room 303! I've confirmed it! For those who don't get it, let me explain. Kalru is the last angel. Yeah, you heard me correctly. Those giant monstrous creatures that damaged a ton of Tokyo 3 and the pilots, and Kaoru is one of them. Now, this most certainly unsettles Shinji, knowing that he has to fight him in order to protect Tokyo 3, but he doesn't want to since he viewed Kaoru as a friend. Both of them descend down an elevator and into the deepest terminal of Tokyo 3. And this is when another revolution is as the fight goes on, they go to the very bottom of Tokyo 3, revealing a giant, believe it or not, stationary angel is kept there. And Kaoru's mission was to fuse with it. However, Kaoru realizes in doing so, it would actually cause the third impact. And because Kaoru doesn't want to destroy everyone there, including Shinji, he actually pleads for Shinji to kill him and prevent them from all dying. He gets caught inside of Shinji's Ava unit, 
and tell Shinji that in order to save everyone, he must die. And Kaobu seems content dying here, but Shinji hesitates, asking what Kaobu really is. As the silence goes on, with no answer, Shinji finally squeezes the life out of Kaoru, killing him. A short scene afterwards has Shinji and Musado at the beach, with Shinji questioning if what he did was right, and if Kaoru was really good to begin with. Now this is a really good episode, and easily the high point of NGE. I'm also glad to say that, again, the fanbase does seem to agree with me on this one, because episode 24, Knocking on Heaven's Door, is praised quite a bit. I sound positive, right? We have a good episode? It's fine, right? Well, no. I can think of several things they could have done to make it subjectively better. Starting with Kalru himself. Now, the twist that he's an angel is a good idea, but the impact is sucked out of it because, guys, he was introduced in this one episode, and we knew the last angel had to have been coming soon. With this boy acting the way he was, it was clear he was the primary suspect. It kinda hurts the twist if you find out prior to it, and it also makes the friendship of Shinji and Kalvu not nearly as genuine as it could have been. I also don't really know what Sile was up to. Like, weren't they and Gendo trying to prevent the third impact? Yeah, Gendo has been doing shady stuff behind the members' back, but why doom them all and literally conspire with the third angel to cause the very thing you're trying to prevent? Shinji and Kaobu's relationship is nothing but speculation, and the possibilities are so small. I mean, I don't mean to hurt the LGBTQ to be plus relationships here, guys, but it's so small that can we even really call Shinji x Kaobu inclusive? Like, where's the content? It, like, I understand it might receive some backlash for getting political here, but What's the point if it doesn't go anywhere? I don't see the logic in it being empty. The fight scene, while certainly longer, still could have used some more motion shots or tactics. It's mostly just Kaolu breaking through a few walls, Shinji descending to the other from above, the two fall down, knife clash, grab, and squeeze for the show. I kind of wanted more out of it. So yeah, even though it's my favorite fight scene, I still wanted more. And most in point, the stakes are there with Shinji not wanting to kill Kaoru, but because his screen time was so small, it's not as dreadful as the series wants it to be. Now you see why I'm saying this episode is just average? I know I'm saying, what if it was this way, blah blah blah, but like, as arrogant as it sounds, it is possible for them to do that, because it's not like there was a manga to base the story off of prior to this. This was made anime first. I feel like if Kaoru was introduced earlier in the series, like, say, episode 4, to make a garbage episode actually worth a damn, they could have Kaoru show up, use his optimistic nature to help show a new side of Shinji, Maybe even calm the antics of Asuka, help Rei open up, save Toji. They could make the Ava pilots feel more like a team. Kaobu could be kind of like the, kind of like the motivator of the team. That would be really cool. And that you kind of get to know him, you know, you could use that time as well to bond with Shinji. They don't really imply a relationship. Then you get to episode 24, and then the twist rolls around that he's an angel, and it hits way harder, giving Shinji a reason to be more depressed and make the death feel like there was more heart in it. That is how I would have written Kaoru, just introduce him earlier and make us think the characters are starting to improve, but it's all but a mess since the last angel was right in their midst. That would have actually been a really good idea, and it might have even made the series a little bit more bearable to boot. But it didn't do this, and it very well could have. It's not, again, it's not like there was a manga they had to follow, like a template. I could go on and on about episode 24, guys, and it still wouldn't do it justice, because the entire series is bad. Now that I finished Neon Genesis Evangelion, both Death and Rebirth, and End of Evangelion, I am done. I have no reason to go back. No, I'm not going to bother with the rebuilds or extra stuff video games movie, I'm done with this series. Oh, the ending? Oh, don't even get me started on the ending. The fans 
hated episode 25 and 26 for being so confusing that it spawned those two movies, Death and Rebirth and End of Evangelion. And despite them giving us more context, we still don't get a lot of answers to questions that we all probably have. And... <laughs> Let's just finish this up already. Congratulations! 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 Uh, thank you all. By now, it should be crystal clear what I think about this series. Neon Genesis Evangelion didn't entertain me. It didn't make me think about the stuff philosophically like I imagined it intended to. I didn't root for the characters. The music is just okay. The animation stirred up controversy. All the high praise I didn't see. And most importantly, it didn't feel earned. I said that exact same phrase, emphasizing the word EARNED for the whole video because this is the best way I can describe my experience here. It wasn't fun to watch, it forced so much, the legacy while innovative is flawed, and i just rather watch something else that does the deconstruction or dark formula better. I'm sure Neon Genesis Evangelion blew people away in 1995 when this stuff wasn't common. And if you're nostalgic over and if you like Evangelion for nostalgia, that's totally fine. That's a valid thing. I mean, if Evangelion's popular because of nostalgia, that's fine. Don't try and make it so it's more than that. If you like Evangelion or nostalgia, that's fine, but nostalgia isn't for everyone. I didn't grow up with it, so I can't be nostalgic over it. Nope, not even the old cell shaded animation. That only goes so far, guys. And if something as small as that couldn't make me feel nostalgic, then what else could? Basically nothing. And I'm sorry to disappoint you guys. I'm sorry to disappoint any loyalists of Neon Genesis Evangelion, but it is not the innovative deconstruction. Pico it's the praise has aged about as well as the series itself. And that's why I don't see any reason to watch it by today's standards. If you want to get into mecha anime, do yourself a favor, do not start with Neon Genesis Evangelion. Start with a mecha series that's more bearable to watch. And that is why I'm giving Evangelion an incredibly harsh but needed score of a 1 out of 10. I'm sure that I have painted a huge target on my back, but guys, I can't lie about my opinions. This anime sucked. It blew. It was bad. I wanted to like this series. Innovation and quality can go hand in hand, even though they're not the same. This is not it. I don't want to see this series. I don't want to praise it. I don't want to even hear about it. Because it is outdated. Like, yeah, growing age for a series is par for the course, but this series has not stood the test of time. It is not some sort of deep psychological thing. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure that, yes, you know, people could say, oh, but you gotta, you know, research, find out what this means. No. Rocket science is easier, for God's sake. I shouldn't have to be a translator to enjoy a series that was made to entertain me. Anime is entertainment. This was not entertaining. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Next time I review something, hopefully it'll be better. But until then, I'm Quinn866. Have a good one. And remember, if you want emotion to attract the audience, <gasps> make it feel earned!